الله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Truly all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, sustainer, and controller of the universe. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I trust that everyone is having a good Ramadan. By now, we have all realized that despite the perceived difficulties at the beginning, Alhamdulillah, we have seen it is not so bad after all. And this is the nature with submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A command may seem difficult, but once submission happens, Allah the Exalted provides the ease. Now, we have started talking about some of the blessings of Ramadan. How is it Ramadan is the blessed month? You know, what makes it stand out over all other months? And we've talked about a number of things. What I would like to talk about today is the Quran. Because one of the greatest gifts that Allah has given to mankind is the Quran. It is the one gift, in, and in particular for the Prophet ﷺ, it is the one miracle that, that is enduring. And this is why in relation to the Prophet ﷺ, it is considered the greatest miracle of his, the Qur'an. Because it, it's not something that was performed and it's over with. But it's still with us today and it shall continue to remain with us till the end of time. Now what's interesting is that Allah the Exalted chose to reveal the Qur'an in Ramadan. Of all the months in the year, He chose Ramadan. And this is clear. In Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah says, "Shahr Ramadan, al-ladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an wudan lil-nas," the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed, and we know also from the Quran that the revelation of the Quran is an event that, in itself, gave special status to that time or that night it was revealed. In Surah Al-Dukhan, Allah says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubarakah. Surely we have revealed it in a blessed night. How blessed is this night? In Surah Al-Qadr, Allah tells us how blessed it is. He says, Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. The night of Qadr is better than a thousand months. And if you do the math, a thousand months would work out to be uh, 83 years and a few months. Almost an entire lifetime. So the struggles that a person will take a whole lifetime to engage in, in order to achieve a certain level of blessings and virtues, in one night in Ramadan, that can be achieved. But with certain requirements, of course. But this highlights how blessed the month really is. Because this one night alone, Laylatul Qadr, as Allah says, is better than a thousand months. And the Prophet ﷺ, in terms of forgiveness of sins, he said whoever fasts in Ramadan sincerely will have all his or her previous sins forgiven. But you have to fast the whole month. He said the same thing about praying in the nights of Ramadan, Taraweeh. Whoever prays in the nights of Ramadan, man qama Ramadana. Whoever prays in the nights of Ramadan, iman and wahtisaban, with sincere devotion to Allah, and hoping for a reward from Allah, ghufir Allahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi, will have all his or her previous sins forgiven. But again, this is praying the, 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 you know, all the nights of the whole month. But he also said the same thing about Laylatul Qadr. He said, "Man qama laylat al qadr iman and wahdi saban, ghufir Allahu ma taqaddam min dhambi." Whoever prays in the night of power with sincere devotion and hoping for a reward from Allah will have all his or her previous sins forgiven. So, what might take us the whole month of fasting to achieve, and although that is a blessing in itself, we can achieve the same in just through one night of devotions and prayers and glorification of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. 
So, this Quran, whose revelation is such a blessed event, and as we have seen from the hadith and the Quran, an event that warrants a tremendous amount of blessings and virtues, it must be that this Quran is something very special. And so what I would like to do, inshallah, today, and perhaps in one or two more sessions, talk in some details about the Quran. And there are a couple of uh, perspectives that I, I would like to talk about the Quran from. Uh, Allah says in that verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 185, He says, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. That's one fact. Number two, Allah says, Hudan linnas, as guidance from mankind. So He defines for us the primary objective behind the revelation, which is guidance. We'll talk about that inshallah. Number three, Allah says, وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ That the Quran itself contains the evidence that it is guidance. In other words, the Quran, brothers and sisters, contains evidence to prove that it is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is probably one of the most, if not the most crucial issue that people need to deal with. Because before you argue about anything else, one should look at the foundation of the religion. If the foundation is solid, then you can talk about other things. But if the foundations is not solid or it's problematic, then you may not even need to argue about other issues. And so the revelation forms the foundation of every religion or any religion. And everybody, by the way, every human being will tell you that the religion they're following is the right way. It's the right religion. Even those who don't follow religion, supposedly, they will tell you their way is the right way. I'm sure you've, uh, uh, you remember this, uh, last year or the year before sometime, there was an ad taken out, I believe in Vancouver, on some buses that says, there probably isn't a God, so live your life now, be happy. So there are people who don't believe in God, period, and they think that that is the right way. So everyone believes and thinks that his or her way is the right way, but we cannot all be right at the same time, especially when there are contradictions. So, the crucial issue for each human being is to really ask himself or herself, is my way really the right way? And do I have proof of that? What proof do I have? What tests can I put my own religion through and my own revelation through to see whether it stands that it passes the test or not? Now, this is scary, very scary for people. And that's why most people would never want to engage in this sort of evaluation or audit. Why? Because they're afraid. What if I find mistakes? But for us as Muslims, brothers and sisters, we need not be afraid. Because the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no matter how much people study it, and minutely look at its information, it is not possible for them to find any mistakes. It is not possible. It's impossible. Not just highly improbable, it's impossible. Why? Because it is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And God does not make mistakes. He does not forget. He does not contradict himself. And that's why when you study Aqeedah and you look at the Aqeedah as it relates to Al-Asma wa Sifat, the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are told that to Allah belongs all qualities and attributes of perfection, no flaws. So the picture that the Quran has given us of God Almighty is a being, a divine being, who is perfect in all respects. In other words, 100% perfect. So not even a tiny mistake is allowed or permissible. It can't happen with God. 
So if the Quran is not revelation, then it's, it should have some mistake in it. Even a tiny little thing. But if it is revelation, it should not have any mistakes in it. But what is interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He revealed the Quran, did not just expect people to believe in Him on His say-so, He also provided for people, and Allah created us, so He knows how, how our brains function, right? How our in intellect functions. He knows that with the intellect, the high intellect we have, we will question things, and we will investigate things, and we will wonder why, and how come, and what if. And so Allah the Exalted has provided the evidence in the Qur'an itself that the Qur'an is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are tests, brothers and sisters, that we can apply to the Qur'an and any other book that is claimed to be revelation to figure out whether it is revelation or not. It is quite ironic that even Christians would acknowledge the many mistakes in their Bible. Yet they still believe it is the word of God. This is very ironic. While with the Quran, even one mistake would be good enough to bring down Islam. Because it is based on the, the, the premise that this is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not the writings of any creature, let alone any human being, any creature, human or otherwise. So what I would like to do is go through some of these uh, ways and means in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an has showed us the validity of the Qur'an in terms of it being revelation and not just something that was written by a smart and brilliant individual. Now first of all, there are different ways that this was done. One of the ways that you can see that this Qur'an cannot be written and could not have been written by a human being is its literary style. The way it's written. For as human beings, whenever we write, there's a certain style that we have as humans in terms of writing. Let me give you an example so that you kind of understand what I'm saying. Most writers, if not all writers, when they write, their stories, even if they're fictional, to some extent reflect their, the, some, of, some of the incidents in their own lives. They may change names, they may change places, they may change a lot of facts and so on. But often, the, the stories that they write has, is a reflection of some of their own experiences in life. But when you look at the Qur'an, it is very different from this human norm or this human experience. For example, the Prophet's wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, when she passed away, this was a major blow, personal blow for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. It is one of the events that must have really touched him deeply. Yet in the Quran, brothers and sisters, there is not even a single statement about the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. If the Quran was written by the Prophet alayhi salam, the human norm is there would have been at least some mention of her. And you know, the, the tragedy he was going through and the, the deep inner grief and sadness. But amazingly, not a single word in the Quran about her death radiallahu anha. And so when you look at the literary style of the Qur'an, how it's written, it's actually not written in the way in which a human being will write things. As human beings, we have the tendency to write things in what we call a chronological order. Yet amazingly, the Qur'an is not compiled in a chronological order of its revelation. And yet, Subhanallah, here is the beauty. There, are no, there is no disconnect between what may seem at face value jumping from one story to the next and one event to the next. 
We know that Iqra Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaq, the first ayahs of this surah, were the first verses ever to be revealed of the Quran. But look where it is placed. All the way towards the back of the Quran, in terms of how the or, uh, chapters, the surahs are organized. Read the stories of the various prophets and messengers. You know, take the story of Isa alayhi salam or Musa alayhi salam. This is a, a story that is extensively mentioned in the Quran. A lot of similarities, yet there are also differences. Not always exactly the same. And again, this is a reflection of the literary style that is sort of foreign to the human norm. Now, another uh, a human norm that the Quran has defied is that at the very beginning of the Quran, Allah issues a very bold challenge to mankind. He said, Alif la mim. In this book, there is no doubt. You have never seen, brothers and sisters, another book that makes such a claim at the very beginning. You haven't. And there is a reason why. If as a student, and some of you are probably students, or you have been students in the past sometime, so you can relate with this. If a student were to do an exam, and at the beginning or at the end of the exam, he were to say to the professor, right, at the, right at the, on the exam, the answer sheet, all these answers are perfect. There are no mistakes in my test. What do you think the professor might do? Take your word for it? What would the professor do? Tell me. Cheating. Challenge you. No. He will what? Challenge. He will challenge you. He will see that statement as a challenge. And that's what it is in the Quran. Dalikal kitabu la ragafi is a challenge for anyone who reads it. Because the professor will see this as a challenge. You think you've done the perfect exam? Okay, let's see. Now what will he do? He will go over it with, as we say, a microscope or magnifying glass. Looking for the one eye you didn't dot. The human norm is not to do this. You may think you've done a good job on the exam. But the human norm is not to go with the route of challenging your professor to find faults or mistakes in your exam. Because you know he, he, the professor is probably capable of finding some mistake, you know, some T that you didn't cross. And he will use us as an excuse to, you know, take out a point zero zero one mark or something like that. Not to give you perfect in the exam. Because that statement is a challenge. But that is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done with the Quran. At the very beginning, he says, La Rai no doubt in it. The challenge is, if anyone thinks there is, there is any doubt in the Quran or they can find doubts, by all means, go ahead and find it. And this is another literary style of the Quran. You see, if you did some work, and you believe you've done a good job, you may not really want people to scrutinize it too much. Because if they do, chances are they'll find problems with it. But that is exactly what the Quran, what Allah wants people to do, to scrutinize the Quran. Not just to casually read it, to scrutinize it, you know, take its information apart, study it in details. Because only then the one who does this, who analyzes his information in this way, can realize that indeed this knowledge is not coming from anywhere except the one who has knowledge of all things. That's the only conclusion you can come to if you really study and analyze in details the information in the Quran. You have to agree that this information is coming from a source that knows everything. So Allah wants people to study the Quran, to analyze it, to ponder deeply on it. So he issued this challenge, in this book, there is no doubt. And if anyone thinks there might be doubts, then by all means, go ahead and look for it. Up to today, brothers and sisters, since the beginning of the revelation of the Quran to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, up to today, no one, not in the, not in the Arab world, not in the non-Arab world, has ever been able to claim to, to, to come forward with a valid claim that they have found any mistake or contradiction in the Quran or any doubt. There are people who have made claims, but these claims 
were proven to be invalid claims. So we're not talking about invalid claims. We're talking about real valid claims. I believe, brothers and sisters, that perhaps the greatest discovery in our world today would be the discovery of a valid mistake or contradiction in the Quran. Because that would mean the very foundation of Islam is no longer solid. It would be the greatest discovery. The non-Muslim world, there can be no, no event that will bring them greater joy than the finding of a valid mistake or contradiction or doubt in the Quran. But you and I as Muslims, we should not be afraid of people studying and analyzing the Quran. So remember, the more you analyze and study, the greater your potential to find problems and issues. But we should not be afraid of that. For the simple reason that the Quran is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And God has told us He's perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. So whatever He does, there can't be any mistakes. Go ahead and look for it. No problem. In Surah An-Nisa, in another ayah, and, and again, this ayah is a challenge to mankind. And again, it's one of the tests that we can put any book that claims to be revelation, whether it's the Quran or the Bible or whatever, to see whether it's actually revelation or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran? Do they not study and ponder and analyze the Quran? Tadabbur is not just casual reading. Praise be to Allah, Lord of the universe. No, tadabbur is, what does universe mean? Like, to, to dig into that, what exactly is this universe? Because when you do a casual reading, we actually miss a lot of the deeper meanings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alluding to. It is only when you do a deeper study, praise be to Allah, the creator and sustainer of the universe. So what is the universe? When you understand what the universe is, and then you connect that with the fact that Allah is the creator of all of this, and He's the sustainer of all of this, then you begin to understand why you praise God. So, that, so when you ponder, you do tadabbur of something, you're analyzing it in detail. Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran." Do they not study and analyze and ponder this Qur'an? Here comes the challenge. وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Had it been from any source other than Allah, they would find in it many contradictions or discrepancies as we say. If the source of the Qur'an was any source other than Allah Himself, you would find discrepancies in it. The mafhum is, this is the mantuk, right? This is the literal statement that the verse is, is making. But the understanding of this uh, statement is, or this ayah is, because the source is Allah, the Creator, it cannot have any discrepancies or contradictions. An amazing ayah. Do they not plunder the Quran? Had it been from any source other than Allah? They would, have find, they would have found in it many contradictions and discrepancies. It's a challenge for us to go ahead if we think we can, if human beings think they can, let them go ahead and look for contradictions and discrepancies. And as I've said, from the time the Quran was revealed to the Prophet up to today, no one, even the Arabs, okay, so at that time, at the time of the Prophet, they were not technologically advanced, so they couldn't, you know, verify certain information. But even in the eloquence of language, in terms of Arabic language and the use of Arabic language, even the Arabs were amazed at the eloquence of the Qur'an. They could not even do anything like this, write anything like it. They were in awe of the Qur'an. And you know what's the beauty with the Qur'an, brothers and sisters? And I know some of you may not have access to this. But if you know some Arabic, get an Arabic poem. Put it next to any page of the Qur'an. And look at the sentences in the, in the Qur'an, in the ayah, and in the poem. And you'll see the difference. Arabic poetry is one of the most difficult things to read and understand. It's very difficult. The Qur'an though is written in very simple language. Because you see, in Arabic poetry, one of the objectives is to make people listen to you. 
How do you get people to listen to you? If you use simple language, everybody speaks the same language. You know, there's nothing that stands out. You have to use language that will stand out. So poets deliberately seek out difficult words. We call them big words sometimes in English. The Quran hasn't done that though. It hasn't, it hasn't used uh, the, uh, you know, big words to bamboozle the listener. No, very simple words. Straightforward language, Arabic writing. And yet, nobody is able to produce anything similar to it. But we'll talk about that inshallah. You know, the challenge that Allah has also issued in the Quran to people to produce either the whole Quran or 10 surahs or just one surah like any in the Quran. So I hope that inshallah though, at the end of our discussion, even if it takes a couple of, uh, of sessions, that we will have absolute confidence, 100% confidence, in the validity of the Quran as revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No doubts. Despite the fact that some Muslims or people who call themselves Muslims claim from time to time that the Quran should be updated. You know, it's, it's some of its laws are kind of outdated and so on. In, despite all of that, the Quran, we should have absolutely no doubts that it is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we have that, then it must mean that everything else now is based on, what, on, on a solid foundation, not a shaky foundation. And then, you know, a religion should take off after that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed from mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah be exalted, cause the Quran to become the companion of our hearts and to become the words that are frequently uttered in our tongues and our lips. And may he cause us to be from the people of the Quran who recite it night and day and follow its teachings and its principles.